Hey everyone, welcome to the Greg's Garage Pod with co-host Jason Pridmore. I'm Greg White, and unfortunately for us, more for you, no Jason Pridmore this week. He is stuck in a hospital slash hotel room in Pittsburgh because his good friend Caroline Olson ended up crashing in the Moto America race and she broke, let's see, her pelvis in two places and her her sacrum, sacrum in one spot. But Caroline's okay. Uh, she had surgery on Monday and she's got an external fixator on her pelvis area. She's going to be going back to Norway soon, but it's about a six week recovery before she can even get on her feet. But Caroline was actually going like some of the fastest she'd ever gone in like her Moto America career on Friday before she crashed on Saturday. So she is looking forward to get back to racing. So hopefully we'll see her back in the Moto America paddock for all you Caroline Olson fans. As for this podcast, well, it's presented by Arai Helmets. Now, for three generations, Arai has been making some of the world's best helmets. And of course, Arai Helmets meets all safety standards, but they also pride themselves in a blend of engineering tech and human craftsmanship that makes an Arai helmet fit better and feel better, which of course protects you better. Your head is worth the best. So go visit AraiAmericas.com for more information on tech fit and of course like paint jobs you want to get yourself a really cool paint job maybe matches your motorcycle or just your personality go to ariamericas.com because you owe it to you all right let's get into this podcast first thing up we're going to talk about moto gp now just to give you an idea of what i'm going to do here is we're just going to briefly talk about moto gp what's going on there and then i do have an interview with brandon posh who is an American racing in the British Superbike Series who ended up racing the Moto3 race from Silverstone. And then, of course, we're going to touch on Moto America a little bit. And we have Garrett Gerloff as a guest uh, from the EBC Brakes Superbike class. And then we'll talk about some other stuff. So probably my guess is it's going to be a pretty short one. Let's move over to MotoGP straight away. And let's look at the MotoGP results because it was a spectacular, I mean, spectacular race. If you didn't get to see it, The winner of this one was Alex Rins. He ended up beating Mark Marquez by 13 thousandths of a second. Maverick Vinales was six tenths behind in third. Valentino Rossi in fourth, 11.4 behind. A lot of people had expectations about Valentino. Franco Morbidelli in fifth. Cal Crutchlow, Danny Petrucci, Danilo Petrucci, Jack Miller, Pola Spargaro, Andrea Iannone, Francesco Bagnaia, uh, Sylvain Giltili, uh, Hafiz Sirene, Jorge Lorenzo, and Carol Abraham, your 15 points there. Non-finishers, Quadraro at the beginning had an absolutely crazy crash into turn one, I guess. He's kind of in the middle of the track, lost the rear. The Vizioso had nowhere to go, just ran right into the bike, went airborne. Those two guys uh, got knocked around pretty bad. You know, one for the record books. I think the margin of victory is like the fourth closest all time in MotoGP. The funny thing was post-race Alex Rins had said that he thought that the second to last lap or the penultimate lap of the race was the final lap. So if you watch that race, you'll see Rins just all over the place trying to find something, comes out of the final corner, Marquez had him, and then sees that it's the white flag and then decides to, in one lap, reformulate his plan and went after it again. And a beautiful inside-out move where Marquez was drifting wide, protecting the outside, and Rins just shot up the inside. It was absolutely fantastic race. So congratulations to Alex Rins on that one. Moving on to the Moto2 side of things, another really good race up front and really close between a few riders. It was a race that started close, then it spread out, then it kind of got back together. Augusto Fernandez ended up winning the race. After a 12 laps into the race, there was an exit by Alex Marquez, who was leading. It wasn't He wasn't out clear, but he was leading the way, had a mistake, crashed, and couldn't get the bike started again. So zero points in his championship run, but he has enough of a lead at this point where it's kind of no big deal. So Fernandez won by four tenths of a second over Jorge Navarro, over Brad Binder, Remy Garner back in the mix, seven tenths of a second behind. So those four are really close. Uh, Nagashima, Giantonio on back through the field. So that was an interesting race. By the way, American Joe Roberts finishing 22nd, uh, 29 seconds behind the leaders. Another good quality race that we had. Remy Garner looked much more in control than we've seen him in races past, which I thought was fantastic. Brad Binder was right up there and then just kind of couldn't get the job done. So after you had 
the championship points leader, leave the race, Alex Marquez. It's now Augusto Fernandez. It's 181 to 146. Tom Luthi is tied at 146. Jorge Navarro is tied at 146. So a three-way tie behind Alex Marquez, who still looks you know, much in control of this championship, but we're heading into round 13 will be the next one, 13 of 19. So there's still tons of racing to get after. In the Moto3 class, it was a, a different animal as it usually is, meaning we had, let's see, the top 11 all covered by two seconds. So it was one second between one through seven. It was won by Marco Ramirez, who won by two tenths over Tony Arbolino. Lorenzo De La Porta, your championship points leader, three tenths behind in third. Antonelli, Suzuki in the mix. Sasaki finishing a race. John McPhee in seventh. Foggia, uh, Vietti, and Ayogura in 10th spot. Masia in 11th. Bender, that's Darren Bender. Uh, Aaron Kinnett, that was, a, that was a tough hit for Aaron Kinnett, uh, 13 spot. I'm just going over results. I didn't get to see Moto3 race in this one. Uh, I tried to load it after the Moto America race, and it's still, I can't even get the highlights or anything to load it up. However, what we do know is that American Brandon Posh, who is racing over in the British Superbike Series, was in the mix. He ended up finishing 29th. So that's that's last of the finishers. But it was a one-off wild card ride that he got through his positioning in the British Superbike Series, which was at the time when they petitioned for it, he's leading the championship. So since Posh had his very first MotoGP experience, not as a fan, but actually as a racer and being inside that paddock, I had a chance to talk to Posh. When I talked to him, I wanted to find out first what's been going on with him in general this season. Uh, so far this year, we've been racing in the uh, British Moto3 Championship and uh, just got the opportunity to wildcard in MotoGP in the Moto3 class. Um, done a Moto America race this year in Supersport, uh, the Daytona 200, a Junior World Championship Moto3 race. We've just been kind of everywhere, just bouncing all around, but also focusing hundred percent on the chasing the British Moto Three Championship, and with the focus on BSB Moto Three, I asked him how it's been going so far. So far this year, it's been going good. Um, I won three races, four seconds, and uh, unfortunately, three DNFs, um, three crashes. But we were leading the championship up until this last race when uh, I made a couple mistakes and and didn't finish both races, but. We're still in the in the points, seven points down, and we got four more rounds left, two races a weekend, so plenty of points up for grabs. So after that, the team, you know, they're leading the way, and then he said, oh, there's some things that are pretty confusing about how do we get entered into a MotoGP race? Do we talk to the British people? Do we talk to AMA because Posh is an American racer? Do we talk to the FIM? Eventually, he and his team got all that stuff sorted out, and they got that wild card for the FPW racing team, MotoGP, Moto3 race. But before we get into the weekend, I was curious to find out what level of equipment he's currently racing on in BSB, because that equipment is what he'd be racing on in the MotoGP, Moto3 race. Uh, so we're on a 2018 <coughs> KTM uh, that was raced last year by... I forget who was raced by last year, but it was from World Championships in 2018. And then it kind of just got funneled down to us. So comparative, like compared to the 2019, it's not a huge difference. I don't think there's not too much changed in between the, the previous year. The equipment wasn't too far off, to be honest. So with that in mind, right, you're a racer and you got pretty equal equipment. I was like, let's get into it. How was your overall experience of the weekend? Uh, It was amazing. Um, To be honest, it it was like, I I couldn't have even imagined it before I went. I had had expectations and it exceeded all of them. Like, it was just a really good experience. And before I went, I was really like, I don't, I wouldn't say I was scared, but I was really nervous about how it was going to go and about just stepping into that that paddock and and being with those guys and the whole thing is just kind of overwhelming and um 
when I got there, everybody was super friendly and just kind of took us in and we're, we just had fun all weekend and enjoyed it and learned and made progress every time we rode, which is really good. Found some stuff with the bike and I learned a lot from, from the other riders. So I don't know. I think it was definitely worth it and, and it was a real good experience for me. And I know the team learned a lot as well. Um, with our data guy, he's, he wants to eventually work for a team in MotoGP and my mechanic and everybody that's where everybody wants to be in the future so it was good to get all of us in there and get our first gp out of the way the key in that whole statement is when he talks about all the things that he's learned because you know when it comes down to it you you can't replicate what someone else is doing on a racetrack by standing on a fence and watching it i mean there are coaches that do that that videotape and you know you can get an idea but can you imagine you're in the mix with everyone. And that's a huge, huge opportunity, a huge learning experience. So, you know, I asked Posh if the Moto3 race at MotoGP, that level is going to help him and his team for the remainder of the season in Moto3 in BSB. Yeah. I mean, there's, there was so much little stuff that I picked up on that. I think I can apply it to other tracks and um, maybe it'll help us get the bike dialed in a little bit better on the on the race weekends with BSB just because I kind of saw what they're doing and yeah, I, I couldn't perfect it in one weekend. It's that's impossible. You can't just show up and change your riding style, but at least I saw what they're doing and now I can work, work on changing my style and work on riding the bike better in general. Um, Cause obviously we're not a million miles off. I mean, you look at the lap times and we're, we're within, 2.8 seconds of the very best in the world and only 0.8 of a second off the old lap record. So it's, it's insane. The level in the world championship. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, with that in mind, I was like, well, wait a second, you know, how many races do you have left? So here you are Silverstone. It's, it's kind of the mid, right? 13 of 19 for MotoGP. So we're past the halfway point, but of course the BSB series UK, I wasn't familiar with, familiar with how much he has left here in the U S Moto America. We only have two rounds left. So I was asking him like, okay, so now you have all this experience. Your data guy does your mechanic does you were at that level. What is the immediate future and looking ahead to 2020? What does it look like for you? Uh, the rest of the year, we just have four more BSB rounds. And then I really want to do something in the junior world championship at the end of the year, whether it's, Moto two or Moto three at Valencia for their last round of the year. I'm I'm really wanting to put something together for that. I don't really have any information yet, <laughs> or uh, I'm just I'm talking about it with my team and with some other teams and see if I can make something happen there because I raced Valencia last year and uh, we did all right. But I would I really want another shot at that. And then uh, as for 2020. I don't have anything set in stone yet, but we're we're kind of talking about either doing British Super Sport or stepping over to the Spanish Championship, the CEV, and possibly getting on a Moto2. So you heard it here first, Posh with plans to stay at least over in Europe for 2020, carrying the American flag. So make sure you go check out his Instagram and and you know get connected with him on Facebook so you can continue to follow what Brandon Posh is doing. He's seven points back in that British Superbike Championship after having two DNFs in the same weekend last time they were out. So he's one of the front runners setting the pace. He's got four rounds left, plenty of points, like he said. So a good opportunity for him to possibly wrap up a championship. All right, let's move over to Moto America, where we'll start with the EBC Breaks Superbike class. And of course, a guy who had been really or has been on a tear as of lately is Garrett Gerloff. You know, we were at uh, Monterey, Laguna Seca. He won his first race. And then we went to Sonoma. He won another one. And then there was that second place finish that he had after that. Then he wins another one, which is the first round in Pittsburgh. So for Garrett Gerloff, three-tenths of a second victory over Cambobier, a spectacular race. Tony Elias was third. That one got really close. Those two riders back and forth. If you didn't get to see it, 
check out Moto America Live Plus.com app and get that thing. There's video on demand, so you can like go back and and look at all the races. But this race was very interesting. The whole weekend was interesting from Pittsburgh because it always felt like anyone who was leading at least one time would have a mistake, run off the track and let people buy. Was, other than like Rocco Landers, there was nobody who really had a completely like mistake free race at all. But it was Garrett Gerloff who won by three tenths of a second a race, number one, then Bobier Elias, Jake Gagne finishing fourth, his best finish of the year, Matthew Skultz in fifth, JD Beach, uh, Josh Heron, who fell off and then was able to pick the bike back up and finish. Cam Peterson, Max Flinders, Sam Verderico, Jake Lewis in 11th spot. Lewis looked really fast, but it was an incident where Bobier on lap one kind of came up the inside in turn number three, and Lewis stood it up, and then he collided with uh, Josh Heron, and it was just one of those weird race incidents. As for race number two, it was Tony Elias who ended up beating Cam Bobier by three-tenths of a second, and that race was unreal. Bobier had led, then he ran off the track, and Tony got back around. When Bobier ran off, he ran off through the chicane, and he was on the inside and had to run through the grass, and he lost like a second and a half at least. And the two laps to the checkered flag, Bobier continued to drop the fastest lap of the race and actually did a 140.945 on the last lap. He had caught Tony with like two corners to go, but Tony's so smart, he just kind of protected the inside and the right-hander. Then there's a left hand. It's a corner, but it's more of like a real fast accelerating kink onto the front straightaway, and Tony was able to protect. Josh Heron had a battle with Jake Lewis for a while. Lewis led this race early and looked absolutely phenomenal, but eventually when the tires started to drop off and the pace started to increase up front, Jake drifted back. So Heron on the box, Skultz fifth again, J.D. Beach in sixth, Gagne back in seventh. Kyle Wyman finished on the Ducati in eighth. David Anthony got the finish two in ninth. Cam Peterson, 10th. So really good races. In terms of the championship, though, it was kind of a wash. 35 points now for Tony Elias. And I think coming in, it was like 34 points. Then it went to 39, back to 35. So if you look at the results from the last two weekends, the championship hasn't budged at all. And now we only have four races or two rounds, double headers left. So only 100 points for Cameron Bobier And Garrett Gerloff, unfortunately, um, he DNF'd that race number two. And the thing that's really a shame for him is he was right there on Bobier's tail section in terms of the championship. So it's not completely over for Garrett Gerloff yet in the championship. He's 56 points back, but it's going to take a lot. I mean, you know, unless there's rain at Jersey or something like that, that may, you know, throw a wrench here or there. Tony Elias is in a pretty good position. However, with the EBC Brakes Superbike results in mind, um, you know, I talked about it. Garrett Gerloff had been on a run. He's 11 race podium streak. It just came to an end, but he had three wins, which is first three in the last five races. So I had a chance actually to sit down with Garrett at pit race after the day was over on Sunday and ask him about his 2019 season so far. I don't know. It's kind of been up. It's up and down a little bit. Uh, but but I'd say more positive than anything. Um, you know, coming into the first round and getting a uh, pole position, which was my first pole, and with a new lap record, that felt awesome, and I had a lot of confidence. But then, you know, I kind of threw it away, and in the first uh, threw it away in the first race, and that was a, a bummer, you know. And then I had the the issue in the second race with my fender and stuff, and you know, I guess since then, like I. I've had the confidence, like I've had, I had the confidence last year too. And I, I know I can do this, um, win races and, and win championships, you know? Um, but sometimes it's, it's not the con it's not only confidence that you have to have, you'd have to have everything working pretty well. And, and, um, you know, I think that after, or for the starting this year, the testing and everything we did was really, really good. We made a lot of, uh, good decisions on our setup and we tried a lot of new things that ended up working really well. And, so really just from, from Road Atlanta and onward, it was just trying to, um, I guess, work on last part of the race, kind of race pace. Um, but other than that, like, I, you know, I felt good all year. Um, but it kind of felt like, you know, I, I just, that wind kept slipping through my fingers a couple of times and I, I knew I could do it. I knew I had pace. Um, but then, you know, to finally get to, uh, to get to Laguna of all places, um, which hasn't always been my best track, but to have a good a good uh qualifying to qualify and pole and then also to have a good first race and and beat cameron and then you know finally in the the second race to get 
the to get the win finally i mean it it felt awesome and like i said like i've always had the confidence and I, i've always told myself like i know i can do this but until you do it you kind of feel like you're lying to yourself sometimes so to finally to do it i i was able to tell myself like all right you, you're good you know you haven't been lying to yourself you can do this and uh and yeah i mean and since then i felt uh like we've just improved the bike setup even more which uh gives me you know more confidence and and you know the last couple of races have have really give me um just kind of yeah that feedback or that um that confirmation that that hey like i you know i know i can i can be the guy and and i can ride well and i can do be consistent and, and run the pace and and um you know even mess up and come back so uh, yeah it's just been you know that that kind of journey we you've heard us talk about this on the podcast before when jason's actually here about garrett gerloff and how you know i think that once he gets on a win streak he's really difficult to beat and that's what we really saw at pit race with Garrett. And in race number two, he set the pace early. He went out there and got a great start and was leading the race. And then it was a mechanical that happened really unusual for that, you know, for the, that Yamaha factory team, but mechanical got him out of the race and he was pretty dejected because he had pace. It's a long race, 18 laps, 2.8 mile up and down road course. I mean, you know, he could have abused his tires. There's a lot of arguments about he looked really good because the riders behind him started to sort themselves out, started to fight a little bit. So for Garrett Gerloff, you know, the, the podium streak ends and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, at this point, since we're sitting in a rental car and I have like a microphone up to him, little recorder, the conversation kind of turned because it was that, you know, this is his second year on a, on a super bike. And I was curious to find out it's that old super sport versus super bike argument. A super bike obviously has more power. It's a little bit heavier. Um, you know, you have more laps. So I was curious to ask Garrett, like, have you changed your workout routine because of well, what I thought anyway was the higher physical demands of the super bike? Honestly, I would say not at all. Like, I'm doing the exact same stuff that I was on the 600, and I, I honestly don't think you need more strength to ride a super bike. I really don't. Um, the it's hard to kind of explain it, but I feel like the more relaxed you are on something you can go all day, whether it's an 800 pound motorcycle or, or, or whatever. Like if you're relaxed on the bike and you're letting the bike do its thing and you're just on top of it, fine tuning the, you know, the small things, the controls and everything, um, you know, you can let the bike do most of the work and you are just along for the ride. Um, I guess I can, I kind of really figured that out or, or realized that when I was kind of riding motocross, like, so I would take like a month off and then I'd go back and I will, I would be riding motocross consistently and man, I could ride for 30, 40 minutes, no problem at a, at a quick, consistent pace, you know? And then I would take like a month off and I would get back on the bike and, uh, but, but still doing all the same training that I had been doing besides the motocross part of it. And I just found myself riding tight and fighting the bike and I could go f uh, only go for like 10 minutes and I'd have arm pump just because like I wasn't comfortable with what the bike was doing and I wasn't comfortable with how it was moving and, you know, things like that. And that just made me tighten up and that, that killed me as far as, uh, endurance goes and everything so um and then kind of same thing with the uh, with the superbike initially when i first got on the superbike man it felt like it was uh, a beast and wanting to throw me off and and had so much power and all this stuff and and uh that really wore me out it made me just grip onto the bars that much tighter and and uh breathe that much harder you know and so it you know but once i got more used to it and how the bike works and I mean, I, I feel like I can go ride, you know, 30 laps out here at Pittsburgh, no, no issue and, and be consistent and not have any problems physically. So I think that's the biggest thing is just being comfortable on what you're on and, uh, and know your motorcycle. And, and once you, once you're there, I mean, you'll be able to, to just keep going and going and going because it's really not that much, that much effort. Yeah. I mean, for those that know Jason Pridmore, that he's obviously a riding coach, you know, his dad started a school, I think when Jason was like 14 years old and he had his star school forever now does one-on-one -on -one stuff. He would be making comments on this that I, that I'm sure that I know, you know, when you talk about your body position on the motorcycle, you want to set it up. So you're as comfortable as possible, but you're in control of the motorcycle at all times. So, you know, the way Garrett rides is very efficient, much like Cameron Bobier, And it's just all about being relaxed on that bike. And then you are guiding that motorcycle to do what you need it to do and not always muscling it around because that's where, you know, the fatigue really starts to set in, you know, 11 race podium streak is nothing to sneeze at. I mean, that is absolutely fantastic. I mean, Tony Elias hasn't done it and Cameron Bobier hasn't done it this year, but I asked Garrett, 
if he was, well, if he surprised, I guess, himself on that 11 race podium and win streak. For sure. I mean, for me, yeah. Like, I always expect to, I expect to be fighting for the podium and to be on it. And if I'm not, then it's a bummer. And, you know, if I'm I, really, if I'm not winning, like, I feel like, you know, like, man, we got to change something because this is not, this is not where I want to be. Uh, you know, I, I hate, I hate losing, you know, <laughs> whether it's even second place. Like, it's not, it's not fun when I know that I have the, the speed to be able to, to be up there fighting for, uh, for wins. And, you know, for sure, this class is not easy at all. There's a ton of talent and these guys have their good days. I have my good days. And so, uh, you know, I can't, I can't be unrealistic and always expect myself to win, but, but, you know, that's for sure the goal. Um, and, but yeah, as far as like the podium streak, that's just kind of something that's, uh, yeah, every, the, the timing was right. Everything, everything lined up. You can't plan for stuff like that. You know, it's, uh, it just, sometimes it happens. Sometimes it doesn't. That's kind of that, that X, X factor, maybe that luck, you know, kind of coming into play. But, um, for sure, I've tried to do everything that I can to put myself in the best places to, to be able to fight for podiums and wins. And I think that's, uh, that's been kind of the key to doing that this year. And of course, with each one of the podiums, especially those wins, his stock is rising as a rider. And, you know, there's, he doesn't have a contract yet for 2020. So I asked him if there's any breaking news for us about the future. I mean, not yet. I'm still kind of waiting to hear, but I'd really like to uh, stick with Yamaha no matter what I do. Um, you know, for sure. Uh, like I, I, I want to be here, but for sure my end goal is, is uh, to keep taking steps in my career towards uh, what my goal would be, which is to be racing in, in some form of a world championship, whether it be world superbike or MotoGP at this, at this point. Um, but, uh, but, you know, like I said, I'm just, I'm here focused on what my goal is this year, which is to, to do the best I can these last four races. And, you know, uh, but definitely Yamaha has been my family. They've been behind my career um, since the beginning, really. And they've, I owe my career to them. Um, they've given me uh, some chances that a lot of people said, well, they gave me chances and people said that was too many, you know, like they should have let me go a long time ago, but I'm glad that I've been able to, uh, you know, give Yamaha back uh, some championships and wins and, and um, you know, be one of their, one of their guys. And, and so I owe everything to them and, and uh, I want to continue no matter what with, with Yamaha. So, um, you know, hopefully next year that's, uh, that's here. Um, but yeah, definitely in the future, I want to keep going. This isn't, this is only, uh, you know, a pit stop. It's not the the end, uh, end of the road for me. I, I hope, you know, we'll see. Something to consider, I think are different ways that talent really jumps out at you. Meaning the flashy talents, the Goberts of the world, or the people that, you know, like the Speezes or whatever, you know, that just jump out and they start winning right away. Garrett is doing it in a much different way, more real steady, methodically building up his racecraft, his speed on the motorcycle, and it's not the most popular way to do it this day and age, but I think personally, and I'm sure Jason would back me up on this, that Garrett Gerloff is a rider for the future in terms of he, he doesn't fall off the bike and get hurt very much. He's not smashing equipment up. He takes his time getting up to speed. But once he's there and he gets it sorted, forget it. He's like super dangerous. So I'm kind of hoping that someone takes a chance on Garrett at the world championship level or he gets to stay here, like one of those two, because he's unbelievably talented. And the way he rides a motorcycle, he could bring a lot of exposure, a lot of podiums, a lot of race wins to any team that hires him, as long as he's able to get on a really good team. Now, when I asked Garrett this question, this next question, I kind of thought to myself, there's a possibility Jason might not be on this podcast. But then he said he was going to try and then things just didn't work out today to get it done. But I'm going to keep this question in there because I want to find out if he listens to the podcast. I don't think he does, but I want to find out. I mean, why would you? We're doing it. We don't have to go back and listen to it. But here's the thing. So I just threw it out there to Garrett, okay? I just said, who's better, me or Jason? Or Jason or I? Jason or me? I don't know. You guys will let me know. But anyway, who's better? Just as a joke. Oh, man. Right here, right now? I mean, what? Jason's not even here. I can't, I, you know, what am I supposed to do? You guys are both, you guys are both hella, hella good, uh, you know, what, are you, what do you call yourselves, commentators? Yeah, you guys are good commentators, both of y'all. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, I'd say, 
we're gonna go back a little bit, back to when you guys were both racing and see whoever had more success. You know, maybe that's a better way to uh, to judge. So in, in that case, I mean, Jason's got kind of a record. He's 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 a bad dude. You were too. I mean, I, there's no way I could be going around the track, also riding and also commentating. No way. So, I mean, I think uh, you guys are kind of tied. I, I'm. It's a tie. It's a tie. Nah, uh, come on, Garrett. You know it's not a tie. You set the stage early that said race record, and we know I got junk at that level. Yes, it's true. I used to go around with a microphone in my helmet and an earpiece in and a camera, and I would commentate right from the saddle. For those of you listening for the first time, uh, that started way back in 1997, thanks to the guy who produces the Motocross Supercross series now, Chris Bond, and his, his uh, forward-thinking television stuff. But obviously, Jason has two world titles and two AMA titles to his credit. So, Garrett, I'm gonna I'm gonna acquiesce and say that I got you. Jason's a better commentator, and I'll take that any day of the week because obviously, Jason has raised the game in M Moto America commentating. You know, I'm just kind of toting the line, and we all know how people think about me on that front. All right, so let's move off of that on Superbike EBC Breaks Superbike and on to Super Sport. Because what a story we had in Supersport. First day, 17-year-old, class rookie, M4X Star Suzuki's, Sean Dillon Kelly out of Miami. All right, flashy town. You wouldn't think maybe fast racers come out of there, but he is. He wins by four-tenths of a second in a, in a red flag race, part number two, over PJ Jacobson, Hayden Gillum, Nick McFadden in fourth. Great result for Nick. Corey Ventura, a good one for him, too. Braden North, Benjamin Smith, Lucas Silva. Jason Aguilar, Richie Escalante, Danny Eslick back in the mix, uh, Carlos Garcia, Nolan Lampkin, Xavier Zayat, and Bryce Prince, your top 15 in terms of point scores on that one. Bobby Fong had, holy crap, I mean, just a sick high side, sick, no fault of his own, just, well, I mean, it was because he opened the throttle, but it was just one of those race incidents where the guy was trying to get a drive and in a particular part of the track. And then he had contact with the motorcycle after the fact, and he looked really hurt. And the next day, Bobby Fong got on the motorcycle. They had to lift him onto the bike. He has crutches and all that stuff. And it didn't matter. Sean Dillon Kelly still won, but Bobby Fong was only five thousandths of a second behind him. And Fong led for a lot of the race. It was an incredible race. PJ Jacobson, two tenths of a second back in third. Hayden Gillum, two-tenths of a second back and fourth. And Richie Escalante, four-tenths of a second back and fifth. Bryce Prince, who was up front early in sixth spot, he ran off in contention. Nick McFadden in seven. Lucas Silva, Danny Eslick, top 10 finish. Jason Aguilar, Benjamin Smith in 11th. Braden Nort, 13th. Xavier Zayat, uh, sorry, Braden Nort, 12th. Xavier Zayat, 13th. Corey Ventura, 14th. And Thomas Cassis from Canada, or Canada if you choose, in 15th spot. Incredible racing across the board. The effort that Bobby Fong put in in this championship. I mean, you know, Bobby, he, he's hurting. Uh, he was hurting. And Hannah talked about it in the broadcast about how much pain he was in because we had a red flag. And Bobby Letter, uh, was behind Sean Dillon Kelly at the first bit. And you could tell that it was kind of good. Like SDK was kind of pacing Bobby Fong. And then... You know, that focus that you can have can at least alleviate some of the pain you're going through. But then a couple laps into it, you got to stop and come in. And now the pain's going to hit you again. And you got to kind of reset and do it again for eight laps. So hats off to Bobby Fong, who with that effort and getting ahead of Hayden Gillum after his crash the day before, Bobby Fong leads the Super Sport Championship by 11 points over Gillum. P.J. Jacobson, not out of it either. He's 20 points behind. Sean Dillon Kelly, who's had definitely an up and down season on a roll. He's the youngest Moto America racer ever to get a double victory in Moto America competition in the five years we've been around, which is awesome. And I have a little stat here for those of you that know, Team M4X Star Suzuki is actually run by Team Hammer, which has been around for a long, long time. They've been under the banner in Weira as, you know, Valvoline team, whatever, all those old sponsors. So after last weekend, I got a text from John Ulrich, the owner of the team, and he said, Team Hammer is now up to 80 wins and 227 podiums in AMA slash Moto America competition. 
That is incredible statistic for a team that's been around a while and spent many years not in AMA competition, but in Weira winning national endurance championships and supporting a bunch of riders like Josh Hayes and like um, Jamie Hacking was on that team for quite a while or for a season. And I mean, like the list of people that they put through that team is absolutely incredible. So congratulations to that team. And of course, Sean Dylan Kelly, two in a row, gets the double, 17 years old. What is next for this young, bright talent? Can't wait to see what he shows up with at Barber. Because if he's anything like Gerloff, then the rest of the field's got to go, uh-oh. But on the other hand, you know, that field is so stacked with Bobby Fong, Hayden Gill, and PJ starting to figure his stuff out. Escalante and Bryce Prince have shown up. No Josh Hayes. He decided to, you know, park that bike, and then they put Hunter Dunham on it. Hunter Dunham, who had a crash, unfortunately, caused a red flag day two, had a good weekend. He did double duty in Junior Cup and Super Sport for the MP13 racing team. So many great stories. Sorry I can't get to them all. Let's go ahead and get on to Lick Wally Junior Cup. Uh, in Junior Cup, day one was a bit of a surprise, or race one, I should say, where Kevin Olmedo gets his first win on the Altus Motorsports Kawasaki. That was due to the exit of Rocco Landers, who was way out front, and then from what we understand, had a bit of a clutch issue. Dominic Doyle in second, Dallas Daniels in third. Dallas Daniels, who got let go from the quarterly racing on-track development ride from the week before on that Kawasaki, got on a Celtic HSBK racing Yamaha R3 and was able to, in his first race, put it on the box. Of course, Dallas Daniels focusing on American flat track the rest of the season. But then it was Jacob Stroud, son of Andrew Stroud from New Zealand, who was racing here. Gage Reese, Jackson Blackman, Hunter Dunham in seventh. Uh, Glaudy in eighth, Hobbs in ninth, Jamie Ostadio 10th, Standish, Burleson, Rodeo, Knowles, and Cameron Jones, our last points finisher. In race number two, it was back to business as usual for Rocco Landers, one, one by eight seconds over Almeido. Jackson Blackman had a good run on his new team, Monkey Moto AGV Sport, uh, Blund Lubricants. So Rocco Landers on his Ninja400.r Norton Motorsports Dr. Far Racing entry which is important that everyone says that because Rocco gets a little bit of a bump every time he gets his name mentioned and he's struggling to continue to get to the racetrack uh, these last two races. Damien Jagaloff from Chicago in fourth, Hunter Dunham in fifth, Dallas Daniels in sixth, Reese, Toby Kamsuk, Glaudy, Burleson, Hobbs, Standish in 12th, Rodeo in 13th, Doyle and Grayson Davidson. Uh, Cody Wyman, the third racing Wyman brother, was in the mix and unfortunately two DNFs for him and a DNF for Jacob Stroud in the second race as well. In that championship hunt, it's Rocco Landers, 75 points ahead of everybody. So as it sits right now, he's got 75 points over Dallas Daniels, okay? There's only 100 points left in this championship. So if he beats Kevin Olmedo in race number one, then he would have, let's say that if Rocco finishes one, Almedo finishes two, that would extend his championship points lead to 82 because he's got 77 over Almedo and Daniels, who's has got 75 behind Rocco, is not going to be here. So what that would be is basically Rocco could wrap this Liquid Molly Junior Cup championship up after race number one in New Jersey in about a week and a half time. We'll see if Rocco's able to do that. Stock 1000 had one race. It was a good one. Andrew Lee wins by two tenths of a second over Ashton Yates. Corey Alexander was really close most of the race and then ran into some tire issues. 4.8 seconds behind. Miles Thornton, Travis Wyman, Bradley Ward, Brad Burns, Corey Heflin, Jeffrey Perk, and Jeremy Koluski in 10th spot. Now, this was a crazy one. If you go to... Moto America's Instagram page, there was a crash. I'm going to try to describe it to you. Stefano Mesa, who obviously has just been in the mix all year long, was just ahead of Michael Gilbert. And they were on the brakes going into a corner. Gilbert's behind him, gets on the brakes and tucks the front. Now the bike made it by, keep in mind, they're on the brakes, right? So you have a bike that's braking, now crashes, loses traction. So that bike is actually going to appear to be accelerating because it was slowing down and Stefano Mesa right in front of him is, but the bike got by. But then as Michael Gilbert hits the deck, his helmet 
more like on his chin, actually hits the back wheel of Stefano Mesa. And it was Gilbert's head that crashed Mesa out. Mesa kind of lost the rear and then crashed out. It was it was awesome to see Michael Gilbert okay after that crash. And Stefano Mesa initially was like, whoa. And then I think once Gilbert explained what happened, we showed a shot and Stefano Mesa was very cool about the whole situation. But in that points championship, Andrew Lee now extends his lead by 48 points over Mesa. Andrew Lee could rack up, wrap up sorry, the stop. Oh, my brain today. Andrew Lee could wrap up the Stock 1000 championship at the end of New Jersey if he has more than 50 points in the bank. On the Twins Cup side of things, this was a very interesting race across the board for both races. They actually had double races going on. And where most of the race was, was at the beginning of the race when things were bunched up. Drake Beecham on a Yamaha kind of set the pace the first lap or two. People had to find a way around him. There was some racing going back and forth. There were some crashes, Curtis Murray, Chris Turner in race number one. But at the end of the day, it was Alex Dumas on the road racing world, Young Guns Suzuki that ended up winning the race by 5.7. So on that podium, you had Suzuki, Drake Beecham in second on a Yamaha, Michael Barnes in third on the Ducati, uh, Joe Blasius on the Suzuki, Chris Parrish Suzuki, and then a whole mix of riders behind him. That field qualified 33 riders, I believe. No, maybe more than that. 33, 4, 5, 6, 37 out of 41 people that signed up. So that class was was pretty deep. In race number two, same situation at the beginning of the race. Beecham got out there, kind of set the pace. And then eventually Alex Dumas got away, wins that one by 9.4 seconds. Beecham and Barnes had a scrap with Chris Parrish right there behind him. Beecham finishes second again and the Ducati of Michael Barnes in third. For Alex Dumas, he took over the points championship after race number one. He had a four-point lead. After race number two, it's now nine over Drake Beecham. So in the Twins Cup championship, it is by no means over. I'd have to check the schedule. I'm not entirely certain, but I'm pretty sure that that's the last of the Twins Cup double, double rounds. So they may only have two rounds left. So a fierce battle up top is you have Dumas nine points ahead of Beecham. Beecham is 10 points adrift of Michael Barnes. So Barney only 19 points back. Chris Parrish, Curtis Murray, Joe Blasius, Jason Madama, all within mathematical possibilities. And I say mathematical because it's a spread of 55 points down to Madama's 81 points. So it's mathematical, po- mathematically possible for those guys to try to win this championship. All right, so that's Moto America. And of course, Jason and I will have uh, on Monday or Tuesday, we'll be posting up uh, our pre New Jersey Motorsports Park Moto America podcast exclusive. So we'll have a little bit more with Garrett Gerloff on that one, and I'll see if I can grab anyone else. Jason should be back in California at that time and on his way to actually getting recovered. Um, you know, it's hard. Jason's still obviously with a, a broken wrist and or a broken hand or whatever it is and a bum leg still trying to recover. In terms of uh, just a little bit of news, you know, the final round of the Lucas Oil Pro Motocross Championship happened in Crawfordsville, Indiana. And Jason's boy, Adam Cianciarillo, wins his first pro title on his way to the 450 class next year for Monster Energy Kawasaki. His teammate will be Eli Tomac or ET3. He goes 3-1 and wins the overall over Roxon and Zach Osborne. The MotoGP 2020 provisional calendar is out and a couple notes that that was released uh, last night, I believe. Uh, MotoGP will be coming to Circuit of the Americas in the United States. It's scheduled. Now, this is a provisional calendar, so but it's scheduled for April 5th weekend, so the same weekend it's been on. So if you're thinking about hotels, thinking about coming to the MotoGP race, uh, you know, definitely do that. My guess is that Moto America will be there to support you know, MotoGP again. I don't know. No schedule has been announced uh, for Moto America other than... There was a report on roadracingworld.com that we are going to Moto America. I say we, like I'm part of the series, but we're going to the Ridge Motorsports Park, south of Seattle, north of Portland. I've been there with Jason, ridden it, pedaled my bicycle around the place. Absolutely phenomenal, beautiful racetrack. Very interesting track. You basically have a front straightaway that's on par, on level with the paddock. And then you go down the front straightaway going counterclockwise, take a left and go up this hill, and the, most of the racetrack is on top of the ridge, and then you actually come back down. So there will be one of the Moto America uh, racetracks that's going to drop off the calendar because they're going to keep it to 10, 
but Pacific Northwest Moto America is coming up to see you next year. So keep an eye on motoamerica.com or all the social media for when that calendar is going to be coming out. Also, the MotoGP series, by the way, when talking about their calendar, it extends to 20 races next season. So they keep adding a race here or there. It's going to be crazy. I mean, eventually we're going to be racing Christmas time because they're getting real close to our Thanksgiving. But of course, that's just U.S. Also, just came out before the podcast started, Scott Redding, who's racing in BSB, former MotoGP racer, will be moving to World Superbike for 2020 with the Aruba.it team partnering up with Chaz Davis. We're going to have more on that next week as you know, World Superbike is actually getting finally getting off of their summer break and they're going to come back racing. And speaking of racing, this weekend, American Flat Track has a couple in Springfield, Illinois, both Saturday and Sunday. You want to check that out. The AMA West and East Hair Scrambles are in Stillwater, Oklahoma. World Speedway is in Germany. And like I said, it is almost time for World Superbike to come back. Well, sorry you had to suffer through with me. I hope you enjoyed the podcast of getting to listen to Garrett Gerloff and, of course, Brandon Posh. And thanks to those two men for taking the time out to join us here on the podcast. Follow us on social media. If you have any questions, let us know. Make sure you check out MotoAmerica.com for information about races. We're coming to New Jersey Motorsports Park in about a week's time. And then we're going to finish off the year two weeks after that at Barber Motorsports Park. So thanks for joining us here on the podcast, or me, I guess. And um, we'll have a couple next week. See ya. Thank you.